Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Cloud Technologist Show. This is the show for technology professionals interested in the trends and technologies impacting the world of cloud. I'm today's host, Tobias, Cloud Technologist at VMware, joined by the wonderful Martine and Mandy. Hi, Martine. Hello. Hi, Mandy. Hi. So today, we are diving into the world of artificial intelligence. And I'm sure that this won't be our last podcast on artificial intelligence or AI, but this one is the first. And so we have a lot of different perspectives and angles and things to consider. So let's look at the breadth of AI today is what I'm thinking. But let's get into it, look at some different angles and see how deep we can get. Firstly, I don't know about you, but I was thinking about why is AI suddenly everywhere? Why are we hearing about it on Twitter? Why are new solutions coming out with regards to AI? I know I have my own opinion on why that is, but are you guys starting to see AI come up more often than maybe you would have done a few years ago? Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, I was thinking back to... Why, why do I think that that's happening? Why do we think no, that's happening? I was kind of pondering why, you know. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say we are seeing a lot a lot more of it, the good and the bad. Like, you know, it had a lot of promise early on, and then we've seen some pretty large failures, as you do with anything. But I think we see more and more of it because it takes huge amounts of processing power, and we finally get to the, getting to the point where that processing power is available for um, more than just, you know, those those huge organizations that can fund it. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the main reasons, isn't it? Why it's why it's now possible is because, you know, I, I think wh when I was doing some reading about AI and I was trying to get up to speed on what machine learning is and all this kind of stuff, like uh, you know, previously, there was there was a person, a man called Richard Bellman, and this was in the late fifties. He came up with this um, this equation. He was a mathematician, and it was all about breaking a problem down into sub problems and then iterating on those sub problems to come to a result. And that mm -hmm. seems like that was basically the, the, the birth of the concept of AI, of being able to solve those kind of problems. But obviously back in the 50s, there was no compute power like we have today. It just, it wasn't there. So I think it's had to wait for this kind of tangent of Moore's law to catch up with what we could potentially do and what the use cases are, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it is the thing that that's natural progression, right? I've been living in IT for the last 20 years, basically went to university and then moved into the world of IT. And it's been progressing ever since, right? You call it Moore's Law, but it's been continuing to do with the compute power. But of course, also the thinking around basically how do we incorporate the machine thinking, because that's ultimately the thing that we want to move towards, that incorporating that into the solutions that are at hand. And I think we're now in this, this kind of like revolution which is taking place, right? We first have from manual to automation, and now coming to the to the, 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 the point where can we put the human out of the equation and let the machine think for us? And that's of course a scary thing, right? Because we've all seen these terror movies that, that like like Terminator and, and, and the Matrix and that kind of stuff. But I think ultimately it all comes down to the thing from how can we naturally move towards that? And there's pros and cons to the, the use of technology. But it's the same thing like like basically when Ford asked from what to build for people, yeah, and they basically came back from, yeah, a faster horse. And that's the same thing now, which is currently happening, right? We don't know yet what's going to happen, but I think ultimately artificial intelligence is going to help us forward in this age of computers, which we're currently at, to our benefit, hopefully. But of course, we need to look at all the uh, uh, things that come with artificial intelligence. And I'm particularly interested in the ethics of artificial intelligence. Absolutely. Yeah, that is an interesting one, actually, the, the ethical side. I was watching a documentary on that recently and how, you know, essentially a lot of machine learning algorithms, because they're using historical data, that historical data might be biased in different ways. As a society, we might have moved beyond that bias, but because the data is the data, the AI will suggest things that still take that bias. And I'm kind of being a little bit sensitive to, to the content of that. But I think in general, that's, that's probably true. And I think we have to be really careful with that as well. That's, that's kind of a scary even thing. Today but... uh, even today, there's bias. I mean, even today, there's a lot of bias. It all depends on your data set. Yeah. Um, and so we still run into, like with facial recognition and those kinds of things, we're still running into a horrible amount of bias. 
Um, I think there's an awful lot of promise uh, for for AI. Um, you know, I look at it both from a technology perspective and as a consumer. As a consumer, I haven't been particularly impressed with you know intelligence in systems. So, an, as an example, I have a Nest thermostat, which you know learned my preferred um, uh, comfort in the house and led me to remove and replace a, a, my air conditioning unit with a brand new one. And I still had problems. And it was because it learned um, that, uh, or it thought it did, that we preferred it to be a little bit warmer than we actually did, um, which I, how that happened, I don't know. So we ended up just turning off all of that. Um, and then my Tesla, right? I know that, I think you have a Tesla, right? Yeah. And so um, no, I'm, one of, no. Oh, no. I'm one of the few people that doesn't use the um, the autopilot because I don't trust it. Plus, when I do use it, the autopilot is a horrible driver. Um, you know, I always <laughs> think when I'm behind somebody on the road and they're driving terribly, I'm like, that's, that's the autopilot. Um, but, you know, there was a software update once where it would just have you, it would just slam on the brakes when you were going um, really fast, which is a terrible thing. It changes lanes horribly. It's just, you know, it doesn't merge, you know, uh, quite as I would. Um, it's basically a Minnesota driver. And so I don't use it. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because when we talk about automation, there's often a bit of a, a sliding scale of, you know, can you automate it? Should you automate it? And when you automate it, is it better than doing it manually. And often you have to kind of weigh that up of, okay, it might not do it quite as well, but it's gonna give me all of this time back that I need to do something else. So so there's, yeah, there's lots of different like angles to it, isn't there, of, of whether, like with your thermostat, if, if, if you were messing with it all the time, and the answer was, you're gonna be slightly hotter, but you're never gonna to have to touch this again. Again, that depends on how busy you are and, and all those things, doesn't it? It's trying to trying to. Yeah, but again, it, it comes with natural progression, right? Because we can have a full negative episode on what artificial intelligence means. <laughs> but look, that that's the thing, the nature of, of how things evolve. And I think if you look at 10 to 20 years, it will probably be a lot better. Oh, will it be there that it's, it's fully self-capable? Because that's basically where we're moving towards or what the ideal future is. I don't think so, uh, but I think it will aid towards what we are doing. But then every area we apply artificial intelligence towards, that's basically going to ha go through that evolutionary step. If it be in cars, if it's in your home, if it's it's basically in the hospital, wherever we implement it, or what we typically talk about IT, it's a step-by-step -step process. And if you look in, into IT, I think currently, and I had a discussion with, with one of the analyst firms around it, it's, there's a lot of AI washing currently going on that everybody with an algorithm basically uh, has, has something. Okay. And that's the thing that we need to think about, about IT. How far are we? And actually, the thing that I would recommend to everybody is from whenever anybody talks about AI or AI ops or whatever, investigate it yourself before believing what's being told. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, there's, fair enough. There. there's a lot of power there. Um, but as we know, in IT systems, systems fail. And so, uh, you know, as well as the ethical side that we've already touched on, just because of the bias in whatever data set you, um, you end up using, there's, you also have to build in for failure. So even with planes and autopilot, um, there's a pilot right there to step in and will take over critical parts like, take, you know, landing and takeoff and those kinds of things. So it has to be a balance like everything else. You can't just hand over all of the power to, um, to you know, to a, a processor. Um, there has to be a balance like everything in life. Agreed. And, you know, we've mentioned a few different areas where AI is being used already. And, and I think it's only growing, right? Because the other thing that we didn't have in the 50s, you know, you know, when we didn't have the compute power either, was we, we didn't have the data. And right, right now, there's data for everything. You know, we socialize online, we bank online, we buy things online, you know, everything that you can, we even log our exercises. And, you know, I have my sleep tracking ring now that my, there's data about my sleep. So all of these different things, you know, it was just not possible before. And now we have, you know, we have this compute power, we have this data to do it. We have the algorithms that have kind of obviously improved since the time that, that Richard Bellman came up with the first one. But the world just seems to be exploding of it with, with new use cases and new ways of doing things all the time. So we um, 
position, and most companies with with monitoring systems now do. Uh, the CTAB a couple of years ago, one of my customers said, um, AI is now uh, table stakes for monitoring systems. And so I found that interesting, and I tried to follow up and find out what exactly do you mean by that? Like, what do you understand by AI? What do you expect AI to be doing in your in your operation system? Um, but we have it, as you know, in um, vRealize operations, or even the vRealize AI, you know, solution itself um, that will tweak your system, uh, specifically around vSAN right now, but as we've talked about in the past, um, monitor it, see if there were uh, beneficial performance outcomes, you know, tweak it again. Um, but what else does it mean for operations? Of course, we have, to some extent, algorithms that have been there for a long time that we've re rebranded as AI because, you know, um, that's what that's what we do in a trend like everybody else. Um, it just used to be called, you know, algorithms or smart algorithms in the past. Um, but what else are we expecting to hand off from an operational system, like something like VRealize Operations, to intelligence? Where does it make sense, and what does that mean for the for IT ops? Yeah, and I think you've you've highlighted an interesting point as well, which is the difference between machine learning and AI as an overall concept, right? Because I think machine learning is really the one that we're we're often talking about, and it's that ability for you know, a machine to, to look at something and improve on it next time. So try something, did it work, did it not work, improve on it next time. And that's that's the really powerful thing that we're starting to realize in technology, isn't it? And you mentioned the Realize AI, which is, is going to try a bunch of different com combinations of configuration all the time, continuously, and improve on that so that you will always get the best performance. And I think that that's a really cool piece of technology that we can we can talk about. But obviously, AI goes way beyond that as well into things like robotics and, you know, some of the chatbots, you know, whenever you call a call center and you speak oh, to I, know. I'm always, I always say, am I talking to an actual person? And I know I'm, I'm like, sure you are. This is Anna from, you know, Nebraska. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not <laughs> are <laughs> yeah, and I suppose that raises another um, question, you know, is, you know, how we treat the AI and, you know, what kind of rights the AI should potentially have. And, you know, I've been watching, I think I've been watching this um, thing on uh, Prime called Upload. It's kind of a year or two old. I don't know if you've seen it, a TV series where essentially they upload your consciousness into a digital world. And these these consciousnesses run living in this kind of digital space. They don't really have any rights. Somebody owns them. Somebody, you know, they have to pay for things inside there, like app upgrades and stuff. And so it brings up that kind of interesting perspective as well of how we how we interact with chatbots and, and technology like that. It's, it's getting it like kind of weird. That, are you a, a sci-fi kind of a fan? Is that your? Is that I your band? love sci-fi, but I don't watch a lot of tv to be honest i'll watch okay. like one thing every yeah every few weeks or something okay but yeah so the, and there's also ready player one was the other thing i was thinking of i don't know if you've seen that film or the book where um they have a digital world and you know the, the digital world is a better place to live than the real world because the real world and it's like in the future and everything's kind of all screwy as you can imagine we've destroyed the planet and all those things but you know, they have a competition and they, you know, they have their own avatars and they can be whoever they want to be inside of that. So, so there's all sorts of different types of AI. But I think, you know, machine learning and the areas of machine learning is the one that is really seems to be touching our industry and the industry of cloud and, and, and what we do in data centers in particular, right? Well, it all comes back again to, to being beneficial towards whoever operates, right? I always come back to... What do we do from a VMware perspective? We sell software that helps customers run workloads. And of course, we are trying to build in these capabilities that will help our customers to do a better job. Because in the end, well, I guess who's responsible for running IT? If it's either running inside of a data center or if you're running it uh, in a public cloud where, where somebody else takes care of your workloads. But ultimately, it's the IT department of the customer, whatever your business is, is going to be responsible. And that's why I think AI is going to be beneficial, is helping those people. If it's either running the optimal way of running a workload inside of your data center, or having to analyze, for example, what the best cloud spend should be, that, that's, that's areas where we should be investing, right? It's from where we can really help our customers. Because ultimately the goal, I think, is to do 
um, the same amount of work with less people. That's ultimately the, 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 the thing that we are trying to achieve for our customers. Are we there yet? No, not fully. But we're trying to move towards that. And also having that, for example, shared knowledge across, I think a product like Skyline is at its first steps in moving towards that. But there's also artificial intelligence in that product, which is ultimately also going to help the rest of our customers. So there's Skyline for somebody that isn't using it. Sorry? What is Skyline for somebody that's not using it, that's not familiar with it? Well, Skyline, we, we basically gather data from our customers, uh, of course, anonymized, but we see trends within what's happening within your vSphere infrastructure, right? We learn from that and we share those learnings with the other uh, customers that are also hooked up into Skyline. So basically it's a shared memory where we as VMware, we learn from all those customers, from that customer data, and then provide feedback towards all those those customers when it comes to running the optimal way to run your environment. And we're gradually moving all our products under the, the, the Skyline umbrella or hooking it into so that you get the most optimized environment that basically can run your vSphere workloads. That's ultimately the goal, right? That's We are there to provide that, that software. And that's what Skyline's all about. And of course, Skyline collaborates with VBLize Operations, uh, with with vSAN, with uh, NSX, all those solutions all provide data, which then gives you an optimal way to, to provide that. So rather than you as an administrator needing to think from, oh, what would be the most optimal way of configuring and managing this 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 vSphere infrastructure, then that's going to be provided to you by Skyline. Of course, there's always this decision. Who makes the ultimate decision? Just like you said, who's in control? Am I the one steering or is the Tesla autopilot steering? That's still a thing that, but that's more an ethical question, a thing that, that people need to decide for themselves. Uh, but that's what Skyline provides. I think it's similar to what we uh, the, uh, somebody around the DRS algorithm, right? Which a lot of people find very sp spooky from, oh, but then the virtual machine is moved from one box to the other. And it took also a couple of years for people to to get familiar with it and feel comfortable with it. And I think there's still a couple of people out there that do not trust the DRS algorithm, but... Run into them occasionally, yeah. yeah. That's a little bit of what we are building into Skyline. But again, it's additional software that we build into the products to help our customers to run more optimal workloads. Yeah, definitely. And so, so, so more, most recently, I've been writing some, some blog posts on machine learning for enterprise, actually, and talking about some of those use cases. Um, you know, in particular, we're seeing all sorts of different use cases moving forward for, for, for machine learning. You know, in, in pharmaceuticals, recently we've seen that heavily used by the pharmaceutical companies for COVID, COVID vaccine. So they've been mm -hmm. using machine learning to, to try out different different things and eventually COVID vaccine comes out. I have no idea how that works, but I know, I know that they've been using machine learning because we have some customers who we've been talking about platforms for that for. You know, in retail, you know, you have, um, you know, supply chain forecasting, being able to figure out you know, what customers are likely to buy so that you can prepare for that, so you can have the stock, so that you can, you know, you can sell more. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different types. You know, finance, for example, there's, there's a lot of machine learning being used to try and improve credit score accuracy. And that's one of the places where the ethical thing and the bias has, has come up a little bit because of historical data and doesn't really take account for things moving forward. But, but still, massive value in being able to, you know, look at the intelligence and look at, at adding that extra bit of detail into the decisions that you make. But the problem that I see with, with enterprises, you know, leveraging AI and machine learning is that there's a big gap between traditional IT and, you know, people running data centers and clouds and traditional kind of VMs and container based workloads and data scientists who, you know, are the ones who, who are going to be creating these algorithms, looking at the data, asking the questions of the AI and programming and helping train it. And there's a really big gap between these two areas, right? Because, you know, I've spoken to data scientists before and said, you know, would it, would it be helpful if we could, you know, speed up some of this or if we could monitor it more deeply or et cetera, et cetera. And it's a little bit like, and I've used this, um, I've used this concept before, but if you could, if you could teach a lion 
perfect English, if you could teach it the entire English language, you wouldn't be able to have a conversation with it because the frames of reference are so different. The lion knows about, you know, hunting and living outside and, you know, we have a completely different life. So it's difficult, even if you speak with the same kind of terminology in a common language, it's difficult to bridge that gap. And so I think that's what we're starting to see come through now with some of the solutions that VMware is working on with Project Monterey and some of the stuff we're doing with NVIDIA at the moment. I think that's kind of particularly interesting. I'm going to ask you what, to, to talk about what those are in a second for those that don't know. But I think part of that is because those two groups have never interfaced before. Exactly. For ever, you know, if you want this massive kind of data storage and the capabilities to go and process it. That's been a custom system, maybe SGI or somebody, a big expensive system that you roll in and your typical IT team is out of that loop. So your data scientists interface with, you know, those um, the way that they're going to process that data, maybe even, through, you know, since cloud came about a few years ago, they've never really had to work together. But um, improvements have now meant that you can, for example, and you're going to talk about it in a, minute, in a minute, start to use some of your more commoditized hardware to do some of this, um, to do some of this processing. Now that is the backyard of the typical IT ops team. And now they are having to have those conversations. But yeah, they've never really had to interface uh, much up until now. Yeah, we've seen no, it before. We've seen it before, but it was done typically named high performance computing, right? It's from these entire clusters. And I've spoken to multiple customers that basically built specific clusters of vSphere and then running workloads on top of it. But it now becomes a common thing. And I think the main thing that we also need to tell, our, and then I'll let Tobias explain Project Monterey a little bit more, but um, it all comes down to the fact that people want to move towards AI. And it's not only in our products, but we also need to facilitate it, right? Ultimately, we are the company that delivers software to run workloads on top of it. And those workloads typically are used to run software, which is now going to be used for, for artificial intelligence solutions. So we also need to evolve in that respect, in this respect towards a platform that's capable of running uh, AI workloads. But that's Project Monterey, which to why is it some research on? You want me to talk about Project Monterey? No, I'm happy to. That, that's cool. Um, so what, what we're doing with NVIDIA is really interesting at the moment. So for anybody that doesn't know NVIDIA, which I'd be surprised if you don't, NVIDIA are really great at graphics. And so they make a lot of GPUs and they make GPUs for, you know, your, your home gaming PC, but they also make it for data centers. And so the GPUs that are in data centers are fantastic for, you know, over the years we've been using it for improving VDI workloads, just improving the graphics on, on different applications that you run in the data center because GPUs are like a CPU, but can do many more computations in parallel, essentially. So whereas a CPU is really good at, you know, doing one thing, then another thing, GPUs do it all at the same time. And so for some workloads, that's no good, but for things like machine learning, that's exactly what you need. Um, and so for machine learning in particular, you need a lot of compute power and they're also going to benefit from that parallel processing. And I've, I've written some kind of blogs, which I'll share on, on the detail of that. But so that's NVIDIA. They also have a lot of software around the consumption and running models and the things that data scientists will use to to use those GPUs and to and to train and run inference on um, on different data sets. What VMware is really good at is virtualization, right? So taking a thing, taking one thing like a server and carving it up so that you can run multiple different things on it and those things can move around and that's where kind of VMs come from and we've built on that with containers most recently. So what we've done with NVIDIA is we've taken those GPUs and we've virtualized them, right? So that then you can run ML workloads in your same platform that you do everything else. So the GPU can be another resource, just like other applications need other resources. Um, machine learning workloads really need that GPU. So, so we bring that into vSphere and into Tanzu um, as part of the entire portfolio so that your VMware platform is now your everything platform. It's not VMware and then a separate bare metal um, GPU platform. And that's really useful for, for a bunch of reasons. I know customers who are using, for example, in the daytime, 
they'll use the GPUs inside of vSphere for their Horizon VDI workloads and helping accelerate that. And then when everybody logs off for the day, they switch that over so that it's they're running their machine learning um, inferences on it and, and the training. So actually, it gives you way more flexibility in the fact that obviously with VMware, we've been able to match the amount of compute power and the amount of processing that you can do versus bare metal. So you know it's the same performance, but you get that extra kind of flexibility. And obviously, we've kind of tweaked some of the networking requirements as well with things like smart NICs so that you can offload some of the traffic. We've got things like uh, MIG, which is a multi-instance GPU, so that you can actually run different types of workloads on the same um, on the same GPU. We've got some really good demo videos that I'll share of that as well. Um, but really, it's trying to bring machine learning to the enterprise and without having to go completely greenfield and buy a whole new ton of stuff to do this machine learning project, you can do it on premises now. Obviously, you can also do it with cloud services as well and some of the interesting things that we're doing with, with cloud services. But it, it fits into the, the strategy that we have, right? Is from we are trying to build this platform where people can really benefit from if it's either virtual machines, if it's containers, if it's the usage of GPUs to do machine learning or any kind of other workloads that want to leverage those GPUs. It all comes down to we enable that on the platform and that's more and more becomes more important as basically some of the workloads make better use of all the solutions on-prem because then you need to buy those just the hardware instead of paying everything towards a public cloud provider. But it's all balanced, right? It's from sometimes it makes sense to run in the public cloud, sometimes if you do high computation, then it even makes sense to build your own clusters, including those GPUs, which typically is the reference case for high performance uh, computing. But to do that on prem, I've seen a lot of customers that swung back. Basically, they moved everything, for example, to a public cloud provider. And until they got the first bill, came to the conclusion from, well, this isn't really cost effective. It's rather cost effective to run it on prem on my own data center, even if I need to manage it all myself. But yeah, that's a thing that you need to then balance out and, and need to do, right? And that's that's where we try to enable our customers again to be able to do that. Absolutely. And, and it leads me actually into something I was thinking about DevOps recently, because I think, you know, we've we've talked about DevOps, you know, quite a lot on this podcast, and we talk about DevOps every day um, to our customers. And, and I was trying to, th I was thinking about how the AI world and the machine learning world starts to fit into this DevOps process as well, because... You know, as we were saying earlier, we have data scientists who speak kind of one language. We have, you know, fairly traditional IT or, or cloud administrators speaking another language. And then we have application developers talking about something else. And to build a, a useful machine learning application for a customer, you're going to need all three of those things, right? So those, those worlds are going to come together. And I think DevOps methodologies are going to be a really interesting way of, of helping innovate on that. Because if you think about, you have the data, that data is going to change. But, you know, you have the data to train it with, that's going to change, whatever your machine learning based app is. You've got the model, which is going to change quite often, you have different iterations of that. And then the application itself is going to change too, with different features and different whatever. So those three worlds, are going to be continuously going through this loop, improving themselves. So I think you know DevOps methodology will, will help with that as well. And anybody that's you know into DevOps, you know maybe it's worth looking into some of these terms and, and kind of starting to familiarise yourself with it because I think this is it seems to me like this is coming in quite a fairly big way at the moment. Anyway. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I'm pondering on your thinking because I think it's more in the developer space and it's more software lifecycle management. So it's it's to do with where do you get your data? How do you build an application of it? How do you make artificial intelligence? Of course, there's a point at some point where people need to say, hey, I need this service to do basically machine learning for me. And then the question is, is it going to be on-prem and, and, and uh, in the cloud? But the topics you're talking about is primarily in the DevOps in the developer space. And of course, there's some interaction with the, the, the operators, but yeah, that, that's the general thinking, in my opinion. I don't know what Mandy thinks, because hasn't she written a blog post about it yet, Mandy? Not, not AI <laughs> specifically, and, uh, and DevOps, no. 
Um, but uh, yeah, continuous improvement and continuous learning, of course, is at the center of DevOps, um, although it's more um, a people process in that sense rather than machine learning. But yes, there's uh, certainly going to be some overlap. Okay. The other thing I was going to talk about, just kind of because it was interesting to me and because I'm, you know, I'm a nerd more than ever these days, was the um, one of the blog posts I wrote was on the um, NVIDIA GTC, so their conference that they, they do every year. And one of the things that was announced, I don't know if anybody saw this, was something called Omniverse. And basically what they're doing is creating standards for making digital worlds. And that kind of sounds like, oh, useful for games developers and whoever else, like bleeding edge. But actually, some of our customers as VMware are using some of this omniverse technology as well, or will be, to create digital twins of their manufacturing facilities. So take the entire, and the BMW was the example that they gave. I'm sure that's okay to, to repeat, but they, they made a digital twin of one of the BMW factories, including all of its robots that it uses to build cars. And then they have an exact replica in the digital space that they can use to trial new software. So they can train the robot in that space until it works, and then they put the software into the real robot. And so I think that's something that we're potentially gonna see a bit more in manufacturing as well, which which I think is really cool. I was tweeting the other day that they should do a, um, they should do a Mars version of it because the idea of Omniverse is it, it right down to a particle level, including things like gravity and whatever, it obeys the laws of physics. And that's why you can do these digital swims. But I was thinking, how cool would it be if you could have um, Mars and the Curiosity Robo and you could you know, tweak different software that you could run in that. And it just seems like the possibilities kind of just keep going and going and going. Interesting. Anyway, my, that's my final tip for the day is go and check out Omniverse because I think it's cool. Um, and I'm excited for the future. <laughs> Martine, any final words on AI other than the fact that you don't like AI ops? I never said that I didn't like AI ops. <laughs> I just said the, the tip I gave people is from be wary of, of the whole AI ops thing. Now, I think the main question that remains is from are we maybe living in an artificial intelligent world, right? Is from is this all real? But that's a whole different topic. It's simulation <laughs> theory. Probably will not go on the cloud technologist blog if we basically talk Let's about talk that. for another two hours on Let's talk about the potential <laughs> of, of, of uh, us living already in a, in a in a world that's governed by this is all not real but that's another topic uh, <laughs> no i think from from uh, we're in living in interesting times right i think that's the main thing i take out of the the, the artificial intelligence discussion and again of course, we need to be cautious about the discussion, but I think it all is there for progress, as I already said in the beginning. I think, of course, there's these things that we need to take out of it, like having bias into the system. But I think ultimately it's going to benefit everybody in whatever well, we specifically talk about IT. But I think in every area of life, it will have beneficial uh, things that will add towards our lives to, to improve it. Right? I think that's the curve that we're currently going on. And it is really this this steep curve we're now currently going into. If artificial t intelligence takes over, um, I think we we have beautiful times ahead. But yeah, we need to keep cautious of does it remain in the ethics that we as as human beings uh, see for ourselves? Maybe a utopia. I don't know. Maybe a utopia. What a what an awesome final word for the podcast, Mandy. Yeah, I think that as technology continues to evolve, it will get more and more powerful. But with um, great power comes great responsibility, and we're not there yet as a human race. Um, and I don't want to get into, uh, you know, humanity. But um, based on history, I don't particularly have a lot of faith in the human race to do the right thing. Um, so we'll see. But in terms of uh, work and products, it has to still come back to what is it you're trying to do and why. And these are all tools at the end of the day. Absolutely. Good <laughs> so you did a Spider-Man quote, so that's an even better uh, final final word. So thank you, everybody, for, for watching or, or listening. Um, as usual, we'll put some kind of links and interesting things or things we find interesting to, to have a look at. Thanks again. See you all soon. Bye, Matt.